Hello, good evening everybody and welcome to the Lowry Hotel in Manchester. This is the second event of our Switched Oncology Forum. Tonight we're going to be looking at the roles of carers. Now, cancer continues to be one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality worldwide. One in two people born after 1960 in the UK will be diagnosed with some form of cancer during their lifetime. However, the landscape in oncology is transforming rapidly. And what we're going to discuss tonight is what these developments are going to mean for healthcare professionals, for patients, and also, more importantly tonight, for the carers amongst us. We're going to discuss the caregiver's journey from pre-diagnosis of the patient right through to the treatment and support, discussing both the challenges, and we're going to be identifying actionable solutions. But what we're going to do, we're going to begin by introducing ourselves, and if, uh, Nikki, you could start, just say a few words, introduce yourself to the rest of the of the panel, please. My Safe. name is Nikki Hunter. I work at the Royal Marsden Hospital in London and I'm the clinical nurse specialist for immunotherapy and I cover all the tumour groups. Uh, David Hunt, CEO of Vaslinx, and really interested in the discussion today and the role that as a creative agency we can play in, in supporting primarily carers. I'm Emma Howes and I'm wife to Phil Howes who works at Havis Lynx. Um, he was diagnosed with colon cancer um, and thankfully has been now been given the all clear. I'm Rochelle Bogg. Um, I lost both my parents to cancer by my mid-twenties. Um, so now I blog um, about my experiences to try and help other young people that have experienced something similar. Liz. Hi there, I'm Elizabeth Egan. I've just spent the last few years working at AstraZeneca, so pharma, and prior to that I was at Weight Watchers International, um, predominantly working on patient services, including um, caregivers in that development. Hi guys, I'm Parker. Um, I guess my first hat, I'm a dad, um, I'm a bereaved father. Um, yesterday was six months anniversary of my eight-year-old daughter having died of neuroblastoma cancer. She spent five years in treatment um, and uh, finally succumbed in fact, on an immune oncology phase one trial, a, a CAR-T trial. Um, I also work in the health sector. When, when I started, um, when my daughter started treatment, um, fairly soon into the treatment, Great Ormond Street hired me off the wards uh, to run all the technology at GOSH. So um, I was on the team at, at GOSH looking at their tech um, and I've continued to work um, in the NHS in, as a chief technology officer. Um, so I'm very involved in the health sector professionally. I spent 800 nights in the last five years sleeping on children's oncology wards. So I have been an intensive carer and that is now behind me. I'm uh, Jess Mills. I am a musician by trade, but I have found myself on a quite a crazy journey since last May when my mother was diagnosed with a grade four glioblastoma. Um, I have since been intensely project managing her care um, and experiencing all the kind of various blockages and also the other great galaxy that exists out there for, for patients that is or can, could significantly improve survival and quality of life if patients can access it. Um, we've subsequently um, set up um, ACT which stands for Adaptive Collaborative Treatment, which is an organisation co-founded by my mum, and myself and Jack Kreindler to campaign for a uh, full reform on how patients can access the most sophisticated and innovative treatments from the point of um, diagnosis. Hi, I'm Paris and I have cared for my husband, Parav, through um, stage four gastroesophageal cancer. Um, however, on the 23rd of March, he will be eight years from his first surgery. So we've had a very successful story. Although I would still say that whilst I cared for him then, I'm still caring for him now. Thank you very much. Well, there's some pretty awe-inspiring stories already here. We're going to begin with the first question, which is really identifying people. Are we actually carers? We've looked at the question before in great detail at Havas, and we find that um, carers are very often known as the invisible army. P 
People don't recognise people as carers. So first of all, Paris, do you recognise yourself? Do you identify as a carer or is it just something you did? It was just something I did, I think. Even now, even today, it's just something I still continue to do in many forms. Emma? Um, again, I think it's just you just fall into that role. Um, so I probably wouldn't use that term for myself. What, what term would you use then? If not a carer. <laughs> that, that's true. I, you know, if somebody were to sort of say to me, are you a carer? I would have to say yes. Um, but I wouldn't automatically identify my, myself with being that, you know, I'm Phil's partner, I'm his wife, he's my rock and I'm his. Very good. I agree with that. I think, especially with my mum, the term carer ended up being something that was put on me. That other people were like, oh, you're her carer. Well, I never really thought of that. I was like, well, no, obviously I'm going to look after my mum. My mum needs me. And I think even when I was trying to look for help, when you search on the internet, carer, you end up coming, well, are you a carer in an old people's home? Are you a carer? There's even that confusion around the terminology. Americans will call it a caregiver. Correct. And there's so much confusion that I didn't, only when I was filling out a form, did I ever, I'd have to stop and think, oh yeah, that's what they would say that I am. But I never, I was just like, well, I'm being a daughter to my mum when she needs me. Did, that's you, it. did you feel you had your own identity as a, as a person though? Did people see you as a carer for your parents or did you have your own identity? Or I felt or like I lost my identity completely when I was looking after my mum because her welfare and especially because I had two younger sisters at the time. The younger sister was still at school. Mm -hmm. So I kind of gave up my life, moved back home. My identity became my mum. What does she need me to do? In the way that I guess new mums say they lose their identity at first because their life becomes about looking after their newborn baby and they kind of lose who they are as a person. I think I lost who I was as a person because it wasn't about, well, do I want to go and get my hair done or do I want to go and get my nails done? Do I want to go and meet my friend? It was like, right, okay, does my mum, when does my mum need her medication? Does my mum need the toilet? When, like, my mum needs a shower. It wasn't yeah. about me as a person, I don't think. I don't I know think what anyone else thinks. Quite a lot. Jess, how did you feel? I mean, you've got... Am I right? I think four brothers and sisters, am I correct? And yeah, so there's, there's five of us. Um, three eldest are from my dad's side. So even though we, we've all grown up together, my mum kind of uh, has two, so me and my, my brother, and three stepchildren who she adores, who she's very close to. But we all, I think you're this, this so right, you know, you don't, I, I, I wouldn't identify myself as a carer, although in practical terms we are. I'm a daughter and everything that we do is a mission of that love. You know, it's, it's a project of love. It's, it's a project to, to do everything that is humanly possible for the, to save the person, you know, one of the people at the centres of your universe. And that's what generates the action. That's what generates the relentless, you know, tireless work, work and the smallest things to the biggest things. I mean, it's, it's an involuntary response. It's not something that you step into in, in an official capacity. It, it's born by virtue of, of the love you have for each other and, and the fact that you will, you will move heaven and earth to, to, to save that person if, if you humanly can, you know. Dave, I mean, obviously we've been, we've been involved in the uh, Carers White Paper. You must have come across a lot of this when we're interviewing people for that. Yeah, I think it's really interesting hearing what everyone has had to say. So uh, the paper was called In Search of the Invisible Army, which seems really appropriate listening to the insights that, that you've shared. Um, the thing that struck me so far and what I've heard is how well informed you all are about you know, the situations you've been through. And I'm sort of interested in terms of how much of that information you've had to go and find yourselves versus the information that was provided to you at an appropriate time. And that was one of the things we really looked at in the white paper is, is how quickly are we helping and supporting and educating and informing daughters, wives, husbands, so they have the right information to, to support people. Matt, I'd like to answer um, 
that yeah. question as well. Um, of course. I mean, I, I think that primarily I was a dad, but my role as a carer had an emotional content. Um, it also had a logistical component. But the most important thing that I felt my role was was an advocate. And I think if, there was, if I was searching for another word uh, other than carer, it would be an advocate. Um, yeah. So I was very actively involved in the pathway. Um, I needed to be because my daughter was too young to advocate for herself, but also in the adult context, ill people are often too um, ill to advocate for themselves. And I think that um, getting through a complex, a long pathway in a hospital uh, with a good advocate by your side will improve your outcomes almost as much, not quite as much, but almost as much as the clinical intervention. So you need great oncology, you need great nursing, and you need great advocacy. And, uh, and I think that is a skill. It requires knowledge, but it also requires tenacity and it requires confidence. And that, that was a big part of what I think um, both my wife and I contributed to the pathway. Uh, can I just pick up on that point? Of course. I think it's absolutely nail on the head, you know, and I think it's very, very difficult for um, families to be able to identify someone who's both an advocate and a carer within that context. And, it's, um, I am definitely the advocate for my mum. You know, I chip away, I mean, tooth and nail every day, banging down doors relentlessly, driving her, I'm sure, many people absolutely mad by pushing every day to make sure that things are done quicker, 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 because you just can't wait with the glioblastoma. I mean, these are tumours that grow at a rate of a centimetre a month, and nobody has a sense of urgency to get those things done like you do as a, the, the daughter or, 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 or family member. But I have to say that there is actually a really, that that crucial difference has a direct impact on the outcomes that patients have. And if you don't have a somebody who, like you say, who has the confidence or the ability or the network or the support or the resources to be an advocate, it's, an, it's actually a tragedy that the person that you love more than anything who you are also caring for could potentially have less better outcomes because they don't have an advocate. And I think a big thing that has to be addressed is how we can create a system where patients or families who don't have an advocate within the family who has the ability for whatever reasons to, to advocate on behalf of that patient. There's somewhere in the system that provides that advocacy on behalf of the patient because, quite frankly, I think it directly correlates to both quality of life and potential survival of patients. Totally agree. Can I, can I, just, can I just ask about that, because it's really interesting. Obviously, to be an advocate, you're passionate, you're committed, and you've tenacity in the way you've described. Is there an importance to have a level of information in order to have the confidence to be an advocate? There is, and increasingly so, as we get into immuno-oncology, um, it's complex. It's really hard to understand. Um, um, so my daughter went through a, a, you know, a MOAB, a monoclonal antibody treatment um, in frontline. We went to New York for a vaccine. Uh, she ultimately died on a chimeric antigen receptor T-cell trial. Um, there were options and decisions to be made. I was very involved in that. And the only way I could do it, uh, I, I went to cancer conferences. I read. I spent a lot of time um, with uh, my oncologist and in neuroblastoma, which is a small cancer, a rare cancer. I mean, there are probably only 15 oncologists in the world that matter, and I knew 12 of them well. Um, and I made sure that I, I understood um, the difference, and I, and I navigated her onto the right part of the right trials at the right time. And uh, so, you know, my wife and I were actively involved in that, but it took a lot of work, and you can't be afraid of complexity. Um, I think any oncologist or nurse that tries to give informed consent to a patient on something as complex as an immune oncology trial knows how difficult it is to explain these concepts, which are, you know, we're right at the bleeding edge of science now. This is, this is hard stuff for anyone to, to absorb. Bringing in Nikki from a, a nurse point to you, Nikki, do you think there's enough support available for carers? No, not at all. Uh, absolutely not at all, and not on any level. Not, um, not the, the personal support, the, um, the social support, the uh, physical support, the financial support, or the psychological support. I think um, we're very bad at healthcare professionals, and I think we're very bad as a nation for providing all this. I'm trying to get people carers' allowance is a nightmare, I'm trying to get the right benefits. I mean, I think we miss out on the fact that if somebody is ill and stops working, 
the person who is their carer also has to stop working, so you've lost potentially two incomes. We don't perhaps um, understand the burden of having been of being a carer, being an advocate. I and mean, I was for both my parents who died nearly 20 years ago, but I remember vividly having, by trying to have complex conversations with my father's oncologist who just didn't want to talk to me, didn't want to acknowledge, because I wasn't the wife who also had cancer, he didn't want to acknowledge that I might have a voice and that I was a nurse was a double crime. Um, I, I don't think we, 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 we try our best, but we, we simply don't have the capacity or the um, resources to, to do what needs to be done. But defining the care as a category is a good start. Yeah, yeah I would agree with that, mm -hmm. yeah. Liz, do you find, from looking at it from a pharmaceutical perspective, do you think enough inf information is available to uh, your rep or representatives to give out? Is it easy enough to understand? What's your view on the whole information and how it's distributed? Well, I think the information is so complex um, that it's kind of incumbent on pharma to try and make that information less complex and get it out in a relevant way and invest in programs that can do that. So invest in you know, listening to the voice of the carers and actually incorporating their thinking and feedback into R&D, into clinical trial development, into patient care across the whole system, um, into creating patient services and programs and so on. I think the industry is trying to become um, more sort of inclusive in that development way, but there's, there's so much more, of course, we could do. Interesting. Right, we'll move on to the next question, which was, how did you find out about the diagnosis? And I'm going to go to my next door neighbour here on this one, if I can. Um, well, this, especially with my mum's diagnosis, will always stick in my mind because it makes me feel angry every single time. Um, the consultant literally wrote out anaplastic astrocytoma, went like that, said, that's the name of the tumour. Shocking. Um, so... How I was are like, you supposed to deal with that? So I said, what does that mean? What is that? Like, generally, <laughs> like that, I was like, I... I don't know what that means. There was just me, my mum, my two younger sisters. So he was like, oh, 25% chance of surviving up to two years. And that was that. So obviously I was like, well, no, there must be something. I was like, we lost our dad. I was like, we were six, 10 and 14 when we lost our dad. So obviously I, I was like, there must be something that, that I don't understand. Like, what, what are you gonna do? So he was like, well, no, there, there isn't anything. He was like, you'll be able to discuss with someone else. I was just in floods of tears. My mum, by that stage, the tumour, she was kind of not processing things that well. So she just, I remember, because it breaks my heart, she literally had one tear, and then she was like, oh, I'll be all right, don't worry about it. And then I was just like crying and crying. And then he said, oh, the room next door is free. There are some tissues in there if you want to go through, because I've got someone else to see. That is, and that was that. It's was that. so it's shocking cool. to think that people are actually dealt by dealt with like that in today's society. Was that a GP or a consultant? No, that was the consultant. Oh, that, yeah. that is shocking. That is truly shocking. No, a bed, I have to say, bedside manner is absolutely everything. We, we've moved, I'm not going to start, I won't get into the specifics, even though it does make my blood boil. But we are now at the Marsden, which is, we're having a really positive experience with having been somewhere else before. And um, I have to say, you can say the most difficult things that you could possibly conceive to hear as a family and as a patient, but you say them gently and you say them with love and you say them kindly and with a sense of optimism. Mm -hmm. You know, you say, but there's, we're gonna do this and we're gonna do that and we're gonna take every day at a time and don't look too far ahead. This is where we are, you know, as and we had quite a similar experience. Yeah, in, and for in, me, and that is part of your job and I understand absolutely. yes absolutely you're a medical professional but for me I feel like no actually part of your job is 
I know it's not customer service as such, but your delivery it, and your, no, your no, no, bedside manner, yeah. you know, it's to that care. is, it's that to is part of your job. You can't just, you know, you can't be a shop assistant and you sell shoes and you just throw the shoes at the person because yeah. you'd be out of a job. So I don't see why, when it's the most difficult thing someone's going to go through in their life, that's acceptable. No, I, I agree. I completely agree. And there's, there's, there was two different conversations. Like with, you know, the, the, the median survival for glioblastoma is 14 months, right, from the point of diagnosis. And one of the most, one of the most devastating times we had as, as a family was when we, we met with my mum's first um, medical oncologist who basically had, was kind of laying, explaining to us what this diagnosis was. And then, I mean, I was there with my baby, who was 12 weeks old at the time, um, and he said, and he could see that I was in accelerating in terms of how upset I was getting. And he said, listen, I'm going to talk numbers now, so you might want to leave the room. In the meantime, they had other student doctors coming in, kind of spectating on this, probably one of the most painful moments that my family's ever, ever had. And, um, you know, I think we were all a bit, we were kind of catatonic after that. It took us about two weeks to recover from that one meeting. Whereas that week we met with another team um, based in the States who, and we had basically the same conversation with, but we came away feeling full of a sense of possibility of all the things that we were going to do. We weren't going to look too far in the future. There was lots of different things. Of course, this is very difficult, but it gave us a sense of, you know, of, of everything that we could do to help kind of steer this in a more positive direction. And it was a, it was a transforming experience. It, made, it gave us a sense of agency, a sense of our own, of our own um, empowerment, and as opposed to leaving feeling, you know, absolutely heartbroken and devastated. I mean, it's, it's everything. Yeah. Paris, what was your experience? Because you'd obviously only been married 11 months when poor Ab was yeah, diagnosed. Um, well, he'd been at the doctors with... Um, symptoms of like reflux as such adult sort of reflux and had been on um, medication and living with him I, I my, my father was also um, at the late stages of pancreatic cancer at this same time so I was quite aware of various tests that could be carried out and again it comes down to that he, he was throwing up and not being able to eat and I just said you need to have an endoscopy and we spoke to the GP about it, and they were quite certain it would be Barrett's esophagus, where probably just you know a weakened um, valve was letting too much acid into his system and causing him this discomfort. So we hadn't told any family. We'd literally just gone to have um, this endoscope. Um, I was there because he was being sedated, so I was just expecting him to come to and, and literally go home. Um, when he did come to, I was led into a, a very white room with a tissue box in the middle of the table, no windows. I can see it reoccurring. A closed door. Here, tissue box. Yeah. Tissue box. <laughs> and I actually, yeah, I, I saw the tissue box and, that's, and I knew something was wrong. That was it. And, you know, the um, consultant who had performed the endoscopy came in and, you know, he was very nice. His manner wasn't, um, we, I mean, although we have experienced other people in the same, in the way that you described. Um, but he spoke very softly and he just, but he didn't stay. He just said, we found a tumour. In my experience, we've taken some biopsies. Um, I, I'm pretty certain it's cancerous. Um, and I'll put you in touch with um, a surgeon. That was it. Parker, what was your experience? Um, I, I have no complaints with our experience at Great Ormond Street. We had a terrifically compassionate um, experience actually throughout, um, both from the consultants and the nursing team. Um, we had a difficult diagnosis. I mean, I, I was essentially chasing paediatricians for two years, two and a half years, to diagnose my daughter before she was ultimately given a really an ultrasound which uh, at the age of four identified an 11 centimetre diameter tumour in her abdomen um, and by that stage it was kind of late stage metastatic stage four. Um, so I haven't had these kind of horror stories that you talk about and, and I feel that's just horrendous um, and I, I think that I mean, the way that I would summarise the obligation on, on the health system is that you know in, in cancer today there is 
unfortunately some necessary suffering. We hope immune oncology will remove the toxicity from the treatment pathway. But there's also a lot of unnecessary suffering. Um, and I think a well-run hospital and a compassionate team can remove a lot of the unnecessary suffering away from, from the patient and from the carers. And that can be partly bedside manner, but it can also just be rational pathways. You know, you know, not having an entire outpatient department sitting nil by mouth for eight hours because they can't organize a waiting list, uh, that type of thing. So you know, what I look for in a well-run hospital is you know, people that are really focused specifically on reducing the unnecessary suffering of a patient and the whole family team. And, and I think actually, honestly, there's a cost benefit to it as well, because I think they will be a, a, a easier to manage, um, more compliant and, and happier, and, and actually probably more resilient uh, family unit as well. So I don't think it's just for emotional benefit. I think there's a real um, you know, um, rational reason to approach care that way. I agree. Emma, what was your experience yes, regarding I... Phil's diagnosis? Were you happy? Did you felt, feel your needs were looked after as I, well? I did. I think we were very lucky. The consultant had a good bedside manner. He was very gentle. Um, he clearly explained um, the situation to us. And there was a Macmillan nurse actually in the room who was part of the colorectal team as well. So when he finished explaining everything to us and was able to offer us um, a fairly quick appointment for surgery, um, she then took over and reassured us. Um, well, she reassured me, certainly. Um, she, um, yes, I just found her whole manner and her whole, whole approach quite positive, and I think that that was something that meant that when, when we sort of left the room, I, you know, I, I thought, you know, come on, this is going to be okay. Uh, one thing I meant to ask is, as well, I think it's quite important. They would, did being looking after somebody who'd been diagnosed with cancer, was it as you expected? And anybody can answer. Did you expect the journey that you've been on to be as difficult? or easier or how did you how did it how did the whole thing pan out i'll start with you jess how did your do you have any expectations when you when you found out about your mum well my mum had no symptoms at all she had no symptoms at all she that i i was we were on the phone just probably an hour before she um had and she she you know she was she was 70 in september and she was rushed to hospital after having two huge seizures on the 24th of May and, and, and literally that morning we'd been on the phone talking about and she was saying how great she felt and um, she never felt better and how strong and full of vitality and and that afternoon she um, she got into a taxi and was trying to tell the taxi where to go and couldn't formulate any of her words. She had a massive seizure and um, long story short, three days later after a, a few different stages, um, they did a final MRI and found a, a two and a half centimetre tumour in the, in the left temporal part of her brain, which is where her speech and language centres were. And at that point we were told, um, I mean, it really went, our life went from kind of zero to it, it was the, a thousand. Completely out of the blue in, in, then, yeah. Completely out of the blue. And so I think, I mean, it, that's like a, a kind of dateline which is seared into our into our lives as a family because there was no build up to that. It was like very much life before and completely changed in so many ways after. From your experience in, in the nursing profession, do you find people are prepared for, the, for a diagnosis or? I, th I think it's very difficult. I think a lot of people have a very difficult pathway through the GP to get it. And I don't blame GPs for that. I think they have a very difficult job. Obviously, there are some that are less good than others. So by the time they get to the hospital and they have the scan or they have the endoscopy or sigmoidoscopy that gives them a diagnosis, or, or they come back for the results of the biopsies and they get their final diagnosis, I think most people know in their heart of hearts. I think very rarely is it a complete shock when you're sitting in the clinic room saying, you know, if I sit in a, a lung clinic and we say, actually, it is lung cancer, that most people say, I knew. And actually, I, I have to say, I had breast cancer two years ago, and I knew. I knew from the moment I felt the lump, which I then ignored because I thought it would go away, stupidly. Um, but I, I knew. I knew the moment I felt it that it was cancer. 
I think you just do. Moving on to the next question. Did you trust the healthcare system and that to deliver the best possible care? We found out very early, actually by virtue of connecting with Jack Kreindler, who I know is a friend of many of people here, that the options we were given were, I mean, were the most limited possibly available on the planet at that time, and that if we went elsewhere, there was a whole, I mean, it was like having a very, very low ceiling placed above our heads initially. And through me meeting Jack, it was like that ceiling was removed and suddenly a whole galaxy of different options presented itself. And it was a really big process you have to go through as a family. You know, with my dad, for example, my dad's, you know, 74 years old. He, he absolutely believed what we, he was, we were being told by the, the team there, you know, just eat a balanced diet, you know, all of these other things that, you know, I know you've been rummaging through the internet and blah, 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 blah. When, when actually my mum was discharged in, October, in August saying there was nothing more that could be done because she, they should done the first part of the treatment process there and she couldn't tolerate chemo, so she couldn't do any more of that. And so everything else that we've done has been elsewhere and none of it was, we were told, by our teams at the hospital is different now at the Marsden, but that is also very much as a result of a kind of more global co collaboration that we've been building and creating these different pressure points where there's lots of international discussion, which is creating those options. If we had just been doing what we were given as, as option initially, I, I, I genuinely don't think my mum would, she wouldn't be here now. I think I, I agree in as much as I didn't have faith before my mum's cancer diagnosis because for three months she went to the doctor initially because she was like, oh, I keep... She was saying to me she thought she had a trapped nerve because she was like, I was trying to carry a cup of tea upstairs and I kept spilling it. Um, and so they said to her that they thought she'd had a mini stroke. Mm. So they're like, oh, yeah, uh, we've given you a scan, you've had a mini stroke. So I said, oh, I'll take a week off work. And I went home and I was like, I, I don't know, just something doesn't seem right. So I ended up not going back to work. I went to every single doctor's appointment with her. I had a list in my phone and I just kept adding more and more symptoms. I was like, she's yawning nonstop, this is happening. She's randomly hiccuping non like for kind of half an hour at a time. And they just kept saying, it's a stroke, she's getting better. It's a stroke, it's a stroke, it's a stroke. So she was put on that pathway, going through the stroke clinic. Um, Christmas Eve, they signed her off. He was like, yep, yeah, push against my hands, squeeze my fingers. He was like, yep, yeah, happy to sign you off. Um, you know, you're making good progress. And I was like, you're just not listening. I was like, I know my mum, she's not getting better. She's getting worse. Her right side, her face is drooping even more. Her whole right side is getting weaker. So he said, mm, yeah, it happens when young people have a stroke. Um, here's a prescription for antidepressant. She's obviously not putting enough effort into getting better. So it was that that made me realise. So I then booked um, a private appointment for her to see a private consultant. So within half an hour of her seeing a private consultant, he was like, right, OK, I think there's something more going on here. So that's with what you're saying. I think I then, when you're saying about not necessarily believing everything at face value when you're set, told, right, OK, these are the options, I kind of went in thinking, well, how can I believe you when you're telling me that, you know, these are necessarily the only options or these are definitely the scan results because you've just spent three months telling me that you've done tests and you know that she's had a stroke and all the time it was a tumour. So... I agree very much how you position the, um, the, the kind of optionality around treatments, both internationally. I'm, I'm very concerned that we're going to end up with a big cancer inequality where people with... Um, kind of tenacity and knowledge and also, also money will have better access to treatment. Um, yeah. We had to raise $700,000, to, uh, which we raised on Facebook, which, uh, to take my daughter to uh, Sloan Kettering in New York. Um, and, you know, let's face it, as, as cancers become more stratified and therefore um, patient populations get smaller, um, and you know, China is getting into the cancer research space in a big way. There's going to be many more international options for many more um, segments and um, cohorts of patients, and it will be unreasonable for any 
kind of local oncologist to be on top of it all the time. So there's a real need for, for patient decision support. But I think in your question about trust, we've all focused so far on just on essentially diagnosis and pathway selection. Uh, to me, uh, I mean, we have to remember that a large percentage of patients die from, um, you know, febrile neutropenia and infection, sepsis during the pathway, and it's really nothing to do with your choice of um, treatment. It's to do with nursing <coughs> care. Um, I, I felt uh, I, I was a very challenging care, and so was my wife, and we, we observed every single drug, every single dose. We were there, and that, and that wasn't because we inherently were distrustful of the nursing team. It's just that you can see in a big acute hospital with handovers happening eight, every eight, eight hours, the, the carer will inevitably care more than anyone else on the ward. And, and we, over five years, 800 nights in hospital, we caught a large number of errors that would have been very dangerous. And unfortunately, we also would let a few errors slip through the net, which you know, I still feel um, pangs of regret about. So um, I, I think that question of trust is, is really important to apply that to nursing care as well, not just oncological decisions. But then another component to trust, which I think is a fine balance, is um, many pa patients go the other way and reject kind of clinical wisdom and we get the whole alternative world of care. I mean, it's a very contentious point. I think there's a lot of dangerous information, misinformation, really irresponsible people out there who really are predatory on vulnerable mm -hmm. people like all of us in the room. And I've seen some well-intended but kind of incredibly naive um, um, commentary on the web. But, and I've also seen some very you know, mal-intended um, commentary on the web. And I think that um, you, you, you need to be careful how far you, you go. It's a fine balance between healthy skepticism but also staying within the kind of cl clinical evidence. Um, I'm sure all of us have been harassed by people suggesting that we take our, our loved ones to Tijuana for kind of um, laser light therapy and all of this stuff. Um, how do we ensure then that we're signposted to the right information? Ask Dave on this one. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm finding this all like fascinating. And for me, one of the biggest things that I'm taking away from this is almost like a really important transition from carers to advocates. And as you're describing, and, and that's complicated because of the misinformation that you're talking about and the inequality that exists. But I feel signposting and communications can play a really big part in the transformation of carers to advocates. And, you know, as you were saying, in terms of lifting the ceiling off what, what's to be expected, and to do that, you really require either a different breed of clinician who's opening your eyes to different possibilities, or you need information to be able to kind of to kind of do that. We published a book and Matt featured in it, Healthcare Heroes. And that was about everyday people. That wasn't about the rock stars and the superstars, it was about everyday people. But I feel, which Matt was clearly very good in, <laughs> but it was very important in there that, that I think to, everyone here is a healthcare hero, but I think it's making sure everyone's got the information to be able to fulfill what they're trying to achieve with the tenacity. And I think communication is a, a key component in that. Packaging up what is very, very complicated in a way that people can take it on board, learn from it, and then bring it all together to be informed because some of your stories are absolutely amazing and it'd be fantastic if that could be much more widespread than perhaps it is. How can, how can that, I mean, this is something that I think about all the time, you know, how can, and you know, my mum, bless her, you know, the only time I've seen her cry since she was diagnosed was after she was sat in the waiting room waiting for her radiotherapy and she said I suddenly had the most devastating realisation that pretty much everybody's everybody in that room's fate had been written already by virtue of their privilege of access or income or, or lack of. And she said to me, and that it was the most despicable example of inequality, that some people in that room were fated to live because they were going to be able to access new, more innovative, sophisticated treatments and other people weren't because they wouldn't have either, you know, the access or income to do so. And that is a big question. You know, how do we create the advocates to, to be there for the people that can't do it for themselves? Because I genuinely think that is a life-saving role. You know, how do we create a system where those advocates can, can work on behalf of patients 
um, who don't have that 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 person assuming the role naturally within their, their family. I, mean, I think it's such a crucial a crucial thing to both extending survival and also quality of life. And also, quite frankly, in the bigger picture, the, the, the kindness that comes with that, that if it comes down to it and you, there's just nothing more you can do and the person you love more than anything dies, then at least you all know that no stone was left, yeah. left unturned for that yeah. person and at least you can all then make yeah. peace. Can I, can I just, just, just a small comment on that, which is that bear in mind that most of these treatments that people go for abroad are in trial phase. So, I mean, you're, you're not buying a cure, you're buying hope value. Um, you know, if, I mean, there are treatment modes that are not available in the NHS, like proton therapy, as we know, which is only just arriving in the UK. And, and, you know, the NHS are reasonably good at paying for people to go abroad if, for you know, a particular mode, there's efficacy and it's proven and established. Um, so I, I think we, we shouldn't kind of overplay this. Broadly speaking, we, we have great access to oncology in the UK once it's standard of care and once there's evidence. But I think what most of us are talking about is paying for hope on early stage trials. And I, I, the, the reason I was willing to... You know, some would say make my daughter suffer through going through these kind of um, complex um, trials is because I, just as you said, I, the outcome I wanted for my daughter beyond her survival, the outcome I was looking for was to be able to say to my other children that we did everything rational to keep her alive. And I can definitely say that with real authenticity because she died on a bleeding edge phase one trial. Um, but it, it was paying for hope. We, we weren't paying for a cure uh, or... or um, and I think this is a, it's an important distinction. Were people made aware of any relevant clinical trials at diagnosis, perhaps? I'll start with them. Um, I was just nodding my head, no. No, we weren't. Nothing at all? No. no. Do you think if, if, had, if any information... It's a difficult question. If, did you think if, if that information had been available? It might have been a, a pathway that you might have followed. Certainly. We were always looking for hope or something that might change the outcome that was being said to us at the um, outset because, I mean, we did seek second opinions and they were all um, the same. You know, you've either got to take the treatment or you've got six months to live. So, you know, we needed something more than that. I think you've picked on a, a key word there. there, which is hope. And hope breeds action. When people are hopeful, they're going to they're gonna act upon it. I think hope is huge in looking after anybody. It, I, and I think, like, I, think, I don't know who said it, but someone said you sort of, you almost, you do know inwardly how bad things are mm. when you're looking after somebody. But I think from a... From my perspective, I needed hope, but also needed to feel like I was doing something positive, no matter how um, little it was or how you know, pe other people might view what I was doing. You know, it, it, but it made a difference, and it made me get up every day to want to do it, to make me feel like I was making a difference to his life. How did hope affect you, Emma? Were you... Yeah, oh, I, I kind of I kind of agree with that in that um, it, at a time when you feel that there are many things now that are beyond your control, you want to take control of something. Um, and so post-operatively with, with Phil, um, you know, immediately we were looking at, you know, diet, change, making changes, looking at things like, you know, the Headspace app to do a little bit of mindfulness. And we, and we got that for the whole family, not just, you know, Phil. So looking at you know hopeful optimistic positive ways of yes whatever the future is going to be for us we're, we're going to cope with this journey um and i think that helped yeah. michelle what was your experience did you were you filled with any were you given any hope by anybody or um no i think in terms of clinical trials and that kind of thing it was very much me trying to keep hope alive and that was always very quickly shut down like with a can you just stop googling stuff can you just stop cutting things out of the paper can you just wow. like roll of your eyes and my saving grace was a guy called Andy at the brain tumor charity who I literally still to this day I'm like you are my angel because he was the only person who the consultants would just be like no that's not going to work 
Whereas he was, he took the time to say, right, okay, the reason is, so the type of tumor your mum's got, it grows in this way. So this treatment works like this. So this is why. So I was like, right, okay, I understand that I'm happy with that now because I understand why that wouldn't work for my mum. Whereas I'd come away <laughs> from those appointments with the consultant, like just burning with rage because I'd just be like, I'm trying to save my mum. Why are you just saying no and effectively rolling your eyes at me and trying to get me to leave your office? You had an extraordinarily bad experience. I mean, this, uh, I've never heard of anything like this. It's Honestly, shocking. it was just <laughs> one thing after another. And I mean, like we'd go for the consultancy appointments or, you know, that kind of thing. And they'd be there, like the um, nurse would be there looking for houses on right move. And I just used to sit there thinking like, this is my mum's life. You're meant to be looking up her records and you're looking I'm for a new house. And that's more important to you. That's more important to you right now than my mum and her care. And I just think that just sums it up. And that used to make it so difficult. But I completely agree with you in terms of hope. And I think it's natural because everything else in life, when you come up against something that you don't like, if you don't like your job, you're like, right, okay, I need to take action. I'm gonna redo my CV. I'm gonna go on LinkedIn. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna take action. Or, you know, I've split up with my boyfriend. So it's like, right, I'm gonna get my hair done. I'm gonna go on Tinder, whatever it is, you know, you, you take action. So when you're faced with this, you're like, okay, what do I do? Someone tell me, what do I need to do to fix this? So I think it's only natural that, you know, everything that you're doing, I did exactly the same. I was like, right, we need, we need stuff to help your brain. So it's like, right, okay, what's everything with Omega-3 in, right? Okay, so it was like, Macro Mondays, mum, Fishy Fridays, like all this stuff, because you, you just, you need to do that to keep yourself going, because when everyone else is just giving you negative news, you, you just need, exactly, it's that word, it's just hope, because you need to do it to keep yourself going, to keep, them going as well, I think. We're, we're really interested to understand. So there's so much like energy, fight, tenacity and everything you're describing. And God, if you had like better information and that could be really directed, mm -hmm. then how effective could that be in terms of the support? But it felt like you didn't really have that in terms of, you know, you could try this, you could do that. You were just... Yeah, I was literally clutching at straws and I was so desperate and I think as well I was asking everyone I could, asking friends, asking friends of friends, their dads who were doctors and you know like phoning old school friends I was like oh yeah did, did your dad, was he not a consultant, can he ask that person and oh da, da, you know anyone in networks to try and just think somebody must be able to help because I think especially every film I ever have watched where there's a story like this the ending is like you put in enough work you sit in the library till late at night with your hair up like this and your glasses on and you you know the very last book that you pull off the shelf that's the one with the clue in you know the very last website that you find that's the one with the bit of information that you need to find that's got the cure in you keep looking you keep looking and you'll find it so for me the fact that there wasn't I couldn't get my head around that and, and but Sometimes there is no hope. In fact, in many of these cancers, there is no hope. But that can still be managed as well. And I think, uh, uh, you know, so sometimes there's an information deficit, but other times it's just there's a therapeutic deficit. I mean, that therapy, I mean, it's, it seems like you needed some therapy. That's where... Uh, that family the, therapy. That's because, where the I mean, guy at the Brain Tumor Charity, he was the person who had that conversation with me, who said to me, look, right, OK, this is the stage that your mum's at. This is, you know, what you're describing to me because he'd lost his son to a brain tumour as well. And he was like, right, OK, from what you're saying to me, over the next kind of two to three months, this is probably the stages that your mum's going to go through. And, and I kind of, that brought me peace because I thought, right, it's not down to me to find a cure. There's nothing more that I can do. But no one had said that to me. Yeah, I thought yes. it was all down to me because the doctors weren't explaining anything. They were just so dismissive, like, no, no, oh, no. So I, I kind of sent myself a bit crazy thinking it's down to me. I need to 
research this clinic here, there, I need to, you know, there's got to be something somewhere. You wouldn't expect the doctors are not therapists, but there should be therapists mm. on hand. It's the one thing we, we paid for privately. I mean, we, we, we found <laughs> um, a brilliant lady who had, uh, was a psychoanalyst who'd spent her whole career um, doing therapy just for children with cancer, and she'd written the book on it, and we hired her, and she really made a big impact on my siblings and on us uh, parents, and um, that was hugely valid, but it was a big gap um, in our pathway. And... Uh, Learning to accept inevitables is, is, is also an important part of uh, the pathway, not, not just uh, fact-finding. Liz, going from, from a pharma point of view and clinical trials, do you find that um, if there is a good news story, for example, the amount and participation in, in clinical trials will go up because that people are hopeful of, of finding a... Cure, not a cure, yeah. Yeah, help, help an elephant, how does it work? Um, but the, this complexity that you're talking about around, you know, which clinical trials are open to people and, and to get people there quickly, I think yep. there's so much more to do. And there's also so much more to do in terms of making the whole experience of joining a, a trial, you know, friendly. Um, you know, we're kind of coming from a place where, you know, people get given a Bible of, you know, sign there, this is what you're signing up to do. And of course, where we want to get to is, you know, a much more, uh, a much better sort of customer experience in terms of, you know, this is what will happen to you. This is, you know, a video of, of what will happen on day one. This is the nurse that's going to look after you. This is how to get to the hospital. You know, we're a way away from making it a seamless experience. I think also with clinical trials, and we run a hundreds and hundreds at the Marsden, is when we know that the trial is coming, but we don't have an open date. So you've got these patients that are in, in limbo because they've exhausted um, the, the current licensed therapies. The clinical trial is in the offing, but we don't know whether it will open in one week, two weeks, or two months. And we've had this recently with, with a number of different pharma companies where it's then been put off. We had a trial that's about to close next week, a melanoma trial. Uh, which opened in Australia, France and Italy two months before it opened in the UK. That shouldn't happen. It should be open everywhere. Well, all patients should be able to travel. Yeah. Um, I mean, I uh, in the paper I read, I really feel there's a need for these kind of trial corridors um, internationally, where kind of the, the patient data is the currency of exchange. Um, because ultimately, I mean, it's not just a problem for patients getting onto these small trials, it's a problem for oncologists to recruit for these increasingly small mm -hmm. cohorts. Yeah. Uh, so it really yeah. makes a lot of sense for there to be more international collaboration. No, I, I completely and, agree. And you know, there, there are times as well where a phase one ends successfully, and, and, and then a phase two is about to begin, but there could be a six month gap between yeah. them. So that, can you imagine so, as a patient where so you know a phase one is worse, but you can't gap. get onto yeah. the phase two. So that it's, I mean, but the trial logistics are pretty complicated. Tra trial know, logistics are very complicated. Um, but I think, I, and I think also, and I had this conversation with the patient this morning, that this particular trial has been run at four centres in the UK. Well, that's quite tricky if you live in south of Cornwall or you live in the north of Scotland. And I understand, and we all understand, the complexities of managing people on trials and managing toxicities. But four centres isn't very many. Just, I mean, one thing to put out there, there is a website, clinicaltrials.org, which has all global trials mm -hmm. on all conditions that you could just search, it's free. And the problem is it's technical. I mean, you need to, you need to understand the language of oncology, so it would be difficult for someone day one of a pathway. But normally the trials don't start on day one there. They're kind of later in frontline treatment. Um, so, I mean, just, just as a statement of fact, there is one database that you can go to and you can look up any condition, it will tell you, where the trials are, whether they're recruiting, whether you have to pay for them, what, what segment it's available to, what, what the histology requirements are and the entry criteria. So um, it, it is there. Um, I think we've got a great opportunity to even make that famous. I, I don't think there's a huge awareness about, it about needs, that it, outside of healthcare. It's intended for an oncological yeah. audience, not yeah. for patients, but there's nothing stopping patients. But, but we have many it. patients who come loaded with information. I mean, uh, um, you're completely right. I mean, the trial I'm talking about is, is actually an adjuvant trial for stage three melanoma, which is, is a new concept within the NHS. But most of our trials are for when people have exhausted 
current therapies? I'd like to just briefly explore something that Jess actually said earlier about um, what, we, what do we do about the people who haven't got the access that other people have got to these kind of treatments and this kind of information? How do they get the help that they need in order to, for want of a better word, survive? How do we go about getting the information to them on the level that they understand to help them make the right choices for their own treatments. I mean, I think, like you said, it's okay if you've got the, the, the wherewithal to look in the websites, but many people haven't got that access to websites. They don't know what to do. They're quite stoical, and they might think, hey, I've been diagnosed with cancer. I'll just go with it. How do we help these people? Is any, any apart from the advocacy role route that you suggested, is that the only route, or how can we help these people? Well, it's something I, th I think about a lot, and I, um, I went down and spent some time with the people at the Brain Tumor Society recently, and we, we spoke about lots of different things, including this very practical thing. And one of the things we discussed was outreach, you know, having a, um, you know, a regular identified team that would make, because there's not many, I mean, in the specific instance of neuro-oncology, there's not many neuro-oncology clinics in the, in, in the country. You could have a, you know, a pretty kind of small team, really, that could do the rounds, but every month or to two weeks, they, they would circle back on the same place to have the continuity with patients. Um, but it's a really, really big question. How do we do that? But there's got to be an answer. You know, the technical side of that is it's not... It's not an impossibility at all. And it's something that my mum said recently when she gave an amazing speech in the House of Lords was, you know, the thing that, that scares her is, is that people are just going to think this problem is too big and then nothing will be done. It's not too big. We just, there's some of the biggest, greatest minds in the world on this. And we just need to, we, we need to find strategies. You know, quite possibly I'm not the strategist to do that. But I, I do think having one-on-one... -on -one, I think, I think this role is not something that can just operate in the abstract, online, on an app. I think you need to have real face-to-face -face human interaction with the patient. You need to be able to assess their, their capacity to take on, how, you know, what their capacity is to take this on. And then I think the role of that, um, that, that advocate needs to be able to meet the patient where they are. Because I think some patients are going to want to do everything under the sun travel, take risks, all the rest of it. Other patients will want something quite different, but the point is, is that advocate needs to be able to meet the patient where they are and make sure wherever they are, they get the best possible pathway for what they want or their family wants for them. But I do think whatever that is, it has to be a human role. It can't be something that exists in the abstracts online. So, so like a clinic buddy? Yeah, I guess, or maybe... That, that comes with... So and I think it's good if it's an independent person, so not someone who's part of the team at the Marsden. So I, I, I agree. So concierge. Yeah, so maybe it's someone who... Concierge. Who's, it, maybe it's someone who's part of the Brain Tumor Society. But it's a, it's who a, has patients who... Or, 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 or ex-patients or, 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 or just supporters who are willing to come every time so there's continuity yeah so i think i think there will i think continuity is key and i think building trust with that person is key i think just going through what i've been through with my my own family you know you know both my mum and my dad who i consider to be very kind of progressive thinking people really it took them a couple of months to really build trust in um the kind of the, the team that we were assembling <coughs> essentially quite off piece from the the team we had the official team we had at, at the hospital and trust is a really really important part of that process and i think yeah regular contact you know being able to have you know physical you know it, for, for it to be a real human exchange i think is is so important but you know maybe it's a team you have of five or six people who come who are part of the brain tumor society for example if you're if you're talking about brain tumor specifically who then just rotate round and they have a two weekly clinic at the neuron at the at the surgery and the, it can be the role of the nurses or of the 
the, um, the med oncologist, whoever it is that, that sees the clinic recently, and says, right, every Monday at this time, we've got patient advocacy service where they're going to tell you about lots of different things that are going on, and that person's going to meet you where, can meet you emotionally where you are in terms of being able to facilitate what you want from at least the next three to six months, and then we can take a review. I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, I, with everything, I, you know, particularly the way the health services, I mean, it'd be great if we could fund this, but I think we'll need to have external funding to do it. I think this is the role of the charity sector. And, and by the way, it does already exist in some cases. So um, the, the cancer, our cancer, neuroblastoma, there's a children's cancer called, uh, charity called Solving Kids Cancer, uh, which only looks after neuroblastoma. Um, and they have exactly this. They have uh, not only do they have advocates, but they they actually have a, a, a um, you know band seven um, clinical nurse practitioner full time on payroll, and she does exactly that for the patients. And uh, and, and and she not only identifies international options, she's independent uh, from the um, any of the hospitals, but also will they help with organising fundraising? They help with logistics. They even have negotiators for negotiating pricing with American hospitals. Uh, they help with marketing, digital media, if you're putting a campaign together. They have conferences where the parents and the children come together, the children get entertained, the parents get lectured, they bring all the leading oncologists together and give um, lectures, quite, quite sophisticated lectures to parents. Um, and there's some selection bias in the parent, patient cohort because this is, you know, these are the patients that want to get engaged to begin with, uh, which is not everyone. Um, so I, th th there are some green shoots of resources being out there already. But what is this called? This organization? That, that's called Solving Kids Cancer. But, um, and I can introduce you to, the, to their chief executive if you want. But I think even before you get to that step, I think there's one thing that needs to be done in, in patient education, which is just to tell patients that they'll have better outcomes if they're actively engaged in their pathway. Because there are a lot of people who are just inherently deferential and old-fashioned about their engagement with uh, and the passive. health system. Passive. And, and genuine, I met, and this is not an IQ thing, I met some highly, highly educated, intelligent patients on the ward who really felt that their job was to change the channel uh, for their kid and <coughs> feed the child. But anything else that they did was just going to distract the doctors and they should just be in the background. And I, I, there is evidence that you have better outcomes already. Uh, and it might not be better survival outcomes, but it could be, you know, improved toxicity and, you know... Quality of life. Quality of life, reduce febrile neutropenia, overall, uh, overall improvement in experience and in, in many kind of um, outcomes if you're engaged. And I think a lot of patients just don't know that. Um, so that's, that's an easy... That's a low-hanging fruit for... Um, One of the things we talked about in the um, Carers White Paper, and I hope it resonates with people in the room, is we were talking about experts by experience. So as a carer, you've been through that experience versus perhaps sometimes with the clinician, it's more expert by scientific knowledge because you live in it and you're breathing it and you're with uh, the brother or sister or the family member. And we talked about maybe those people who'd lived through that experience then how can we create a vehicle for the, so you can share it through people going through the same experience mm -hmm. so passing on all that knowledge so trying to accelerate being more assertive or being more knowledgeable and just trying to minimize the time and i imagine that's probably what you do quite a lot of at the moment yeah i think that's something that i'm so passionate about especially because i was 24 um when my mum first got ill and I think not having my dad around as well, that was a massive leap for me to have to make that, to get my head around very quickly. Okay, you're the consultant, but actually I need to challenge you if, because I think I realized very quickly, I can't just take everything that you're saying on face value. But that wasn't easy at first to kind of have to question everything someone's saying, especially when it's an emotional time and you're drained because your mum's woken you up three times in the night to go to the toilet and your little sister's running wild and you're trying to control her as well, to then think, right, now, okay, I need to give myself a pep talk. So it's all those kind of practical things of saying to people, right, okay, as silly as it might sound, I used to get to the stage where I was like, right, I need to listen to like really angry rap music before I go into the hospital to like psych myself up to be like, no, I need to get to that stage where if you say something, 
that I know you're just trying to get me out of this room. I need to be in that mental space where I'm like, no, that's not good enough. No, because last time you said she was going to have another scan. So why are you now pushing it back another month? No, well, I'm not going to leave until you do it. But at first, I probably didn't have the confidence to do that because I was in that space of like, oh, no, it's the doctor. Oh, he knows what he's saying. Like, oh, no, no, no. I think you need to be quite angry to be able to do that in in any sort of professional environment where you know they have the knowledge and you're coming in. um, Because I don't think it's anyone's... it's It's not natural to go in and then question. Yeah. Until and it's a you really thing get to, have to that become point, it's, it's really difficult. It's a really difficult thing to do. Until I think. they listen, especially with some yeah. personalities, because I know I wasn't yeah. uh, um, a very sort of outspoken individual, mm-hmm. but I had to learn to be. Maybe so, not so much in the consultants' room, but certainly in the hospital yeah, when you're when with it, nurses yeah. and and so forth. When, when things were happening that you could see, and around, yeah. yeah, and you needed to just say something or you know, with my husband sort of making demands as such from his hospital bed, and you had to deal with those things. It wasn't a natural thing for me to go and do, or to go and confront somebody, or to get something sorted. Yeah. But you have to. Yeah, and I think that can be a big thing to get your head around, and you're not being bossy, and that, that was, I had to tell myself, okay, step out of it, you're doing this for your mum, or like you're doing this for the person that you love, so that kind of gives you that bit of extra um, so I think that's something that I'd always say to anyone else going through it is okay like forget all of that like forget being worried you're going to get told off or they're not going to listen to you like that was a really big thing for me I think. I totally agree I can agree with you more I agree and it's it's a very strange thing when you you know it's like how could you possibly think you know better than this doctor and it's like I just I actually do it's and you, in, for whatever, you know, whether it's down to, and I think it's such a personality thing as well. I mean, so you meet some doctors, you know, some of the, the doctors we've met have been incredibly open minded, very um, enabling, supportive, um, <coughs> you know, again, kind of like meeting us where we are. Others who have been so closed, it, you, you kind of can't quite believe that they're able to practice. I mean, there are some that just do put the patient first. The yeah. patient is, and there are some that. But they uh, should all be patient led. I, I agree with you. And I think that perhaps, and I, I, I don't know about your experience, but perhaps it's a generational thing that the younger doctors that are coming through, the younger consultants, are more patient centric than some of the people who are perhaps coming towards the ends of their careers. Yeah, well, we had. Well, there's a different training. And, and it's different, not to run different, different world. training. And, no. and different personalities suit different disciplines. So, I mean, yeah, for example, I imagine if you're a surgeon. You need to be, uh, you need to be highly focused. focused. Um, you know, my boss at Greenwich was head of Professor of Cardiothoracic Surgery, and he would tell me, you know, often he would spend eight to ten hours, you know, looking through binoculars at a baby's heart through an a incision hole the size of a loo roll. Um, and in his particular talent was he could do that without taking a pee. I mean, he could go for ten hours without it. He was so concentrated, so focused that he did not even need to go to the loo. Um, so these are highly, highly focused people in some disciplines that, that you, you, you would expect to be maybe a little bit on the spectrum. Um, but oncologists, there's, a, there's a often there's real longevity to the relationship and they're dealing with a whole family unit and it needs to be a core part of oncology training um, to, uh, to demonstrate empathy. And for, for oncologists that are more research oncologists, and um, there's a role for them as well, but they need to be a bit Very more in the background. Very individuals. So. It's not the whole thing. We had some of the most amazing, compassionate, wonderful people looking after mum there. So I just want to say officially it's not to rubbish that it's very individual based. And that, that's, that's what we're saying, isn't it? It's like people, one individual can just throw the whole thing off one completely. One individual just spoils everything. Yeah, even yeah. when you have an absolutely wonderful, amazing team, it just takes one person to kind to of... To say the wrong thing yeah. in the wrong way at the wrong time. Yeah. Or not say the right thing. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to have to call this now, but uh, one thing I would like to say, and one thing one of my biggest takeaways from listening to all these stories tonight, is being a carer is a project of love, and that it's incredibly difficult, and you need an awful lot of compassion and skill. But ultimately, there are solutions out there that we can get to, provided we're signposted to the right information. So on that note, thank you very much for coming along tonight. I hope you've taken some insights from this as much as I have.
Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.